East End criminal and self-confessed killer, Dave Courtney, achieved national notoriety when he organized the security for Ronnie Cray's funeral in 1995. Courtney had won the respect of his criminal contemporaries and elders. He presumed his future was secure, but drugs were about to change the criminal landscape and Courtney's life forever. Uh, my, my friend Francis was standing beside me outside the Fog and Night down the Old Cap Road. A big man, big powerful man. And um, we both walked out of the pub and we was walking down the road to have a chat. We had our backs to the actual uh, Old Cap Road and a car pulled up behind us. A man got out, put a gun to the, to the base of his spine and shot him and blew his stomach out in the road and he just blew out in front of me like that. It made me instantly realise it doesn't matter who you are or what you are, how big you are. You know, somebody on drugs can just come along and wipe you straight out. And it frightened me. And that is the um, driving force behind I'm Going Straight. Tonight's real life shows what happened when Dave Courtney retired from crime to become a celebrity villain, but failed to shed his past. The year 2000 should have made him but it nearly broke him after he was arrested and then accused by members of the underworld of being a grass. These do actually made me feel very, very sick, but they look the bollocks in the photo. <laughs> Absolute bollocks in the photo. Since claiming to go straight, Courtney has written a best-selling autobiography and has swapped the courtroom dock for the West End stage. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please welcome Mr. Dave Courtney. Right then, I'm um, Dave Courtney. There is definitely in this room at least two or three police officers. I want everyone to have a look at the people next to you. And if they are suspiciously talking into their lapel, he is a copper. <laughs> right, now, I'm serious, have a look, because I know that you are in here, you coppers, and this must be really fucking you. <laughs> huh? um, since writing the book, I'm guilty of an awful lot of things. Being a fool is not one of them. And once you've wrote a book, you can no longer um, carry on in that life that you've sort of confessed to the world that you're in. And I have retired. <laughs> you fucking laugh at his jokes, you know what I mean? The book, in the police's eyes, I hope, the book is like getting the gold watch, I've retired. So it's pretty obvious I ain't doing anything no more. And I'm hoping that they will see it in that way. But it's very hard for them to get their head round that I'm no longer active when I look so bloody naughty. Well, I can't imagine what they think when, you know, the, the, these policemen's kids come up and say, Dad, Dad, can I have money to buy Dave Courtney's film? Mum, can I have money to buy Dave Courtney's book? And, you know, the wife's looking at you and I'll see him, well, Vanessa, he's all right. You know, they must be going, ah, no, you know. <laughs> Stop it! What'd you do, Pete? Very boring job. I'm leaving in two weeks to go travelling. Thanks, Clark. Yeah? Yeah. Have you ever been to Deptford? Uh, uh, once or twice. <laughs> Cheers, mate. Yeah, mate. Nice to you. All the best. Why are you interested in Dave? Well, I read the book, uh, found it really interesting, really interesting, and uh, so, I knew he's over here, so I thought I'd come in and get his, you know, get him to sign it and sort of meet the guy himself, basically. Why did you think the book was interesting? Well, because he's done a lot of things I'll probably never even dream of doing. You know, he's lived a life which you probably only see in films like um, Lockstar and Two Smoking Barrels. That's what a book does. It takes you on a journey somewhere and takes you, you do something you, you, and you go somewhere where you're not actually going to get to go in your, your normal life. The apparent freedom of a lawless life is sexy and seductive to many readers, especially when the only damage done is to their wallets. The book has sold over a hundred thousand copies. I'm doing a bust of Dave Courtney because he illustrates very good the point I'm trying to make with my exhibition about people, how they can go from being vilified by the media to being fated on the celebrity circuit. And he's, if you like, this year's model. I mean, I've already cast lots of old, well-known villains from the sort of the 60s and everything, and he is kind of like the newest of the type. He already is an iconic figure to some, and I think he's someone, unless someone shoots him or something, or he gets nicked, he's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger.
But what kind of lifetime achievements merit such attention? When I, when I was a child, I just sort of done everything. I broke into factories, I pinched cars. When I learnt I had the ability to have a punch up, I used to go, you know, I used to go down to football matches. I wanted to be a boxer, every young man wanted to be a boxer. I thought I would be very good until I actually started doing it and that really wasn't for me, you know, it just hitting people with boxing gloves and you couldn't kick, pinch, scratch, bite, strangle. <laughs> if I had to cheat to win, then yes, I would. You know, preferably I'd like to get them from behind with eight and nine of my mates in the, in the dark with a scaffolding pole <laughs> rather than stand up there on my own man to man with a pair of boxing gloves on. That is far too brave for me. The rules of the ring were too restrictive for Courtney. He opted for a different profession. I was for hire for debt collecting. In anything that I'm going to work in, if I'm going to solve a problem, I am the law. Uh, there is no uh, room for debate in anything I've got to say in the house. If I wanted to argue with you, I could ring you up. I'm here to tell you something and you're going to do something or pay me back something. There is not a debate in that. Right? The meek will inherit the earth when the strong say so. The one time I went to prison as a convicted prisoner was in 1980, 1981, where I had um, a knife fight with a few Chinese men. I had um, a problem with uh, the people that worked in the Chinese restaurant and the end result was England won, China never. <laughs> None of them died, but uh, two of them were very, very close in intensive care. And at one stage, I was actually fighting for my life with a Chinese man. You know, it was, uh, wow. You know, how often did you ever get a chance to do that? I could even hear the music. <laughs> You're pumping. Your adrenaline's all over the place. It's very, sort of, very primal, you know what I mean? He's lying on the floor unconscious, and the victor, that is a good time to have a shag with Dave Courtney. <laughs> Courtney is not afraid to boast about his acts of violence, including claims of murder. Have you been up for murder? Yep. Yeah. Twice. I bought was found not guilty twice. Did you do it? Yeah, it's, it's common knowledge that I did, yeah. I did admit it. Mm. What, you killed somebody? I did, yeah. How? I shot him. He was going to kill me. As long as I can justify to myself what I intend to do, I don't give a monkey's what anybody else thinks. So for me to actually go and shoot somebody and risk getting 15 years, please believe me, if there was any other way around that, I would not have done it. I wanted something done of me now rather than get famous for something or get uh, infamous for something that I've done and then they start taking busts and photographs of me when I'm 60. And my house is designed in a way that there is Julius Caesar, Winston Churchill and there's a little space for Dave Courtney's bust right in the middle there. So that's the, that was one of the reasons I had it. Remember me as I am. Courtney's bust sits perfectly at home in Plumstead, South London in his self-styled Englishman's castle, complete with its own heroic mural, a shrine to his fantasy world of chivalry and heroism. He shares his castle with his partner, Jenny, who he met 13 years ago. When I met Dad, I had two young children. I was a single mum. I was, I was promised you I was at a loss. I didn't, you know, I, I had no vacation in life, trust me. And I just, I, he just, grabbed all three of us and just done the best with us. I've done this with us, really. They have three children, Jensen and Drew by Jenny's previous marriage, and Jenny and Dave's very own three-year-old, Courtney, De Courtney. There's nothing violent, there's no violence, I promise you, no, none in our house at all. But have you, um, have you ever sort of had to tell him off for, for being in his work home? Well, I have, I have, yeah, because... <laughs> I've lost the drum of my washing machine before because he forgot to take a bit of his work out of his pocket and it exploded on the spin. Like, 
And I was someone who had done it with a can opener and left it all rugged. Yeah, and then the spent bullet. Happy birthday, dear Jensen. Happy birthday to you. Where me and Dave are concerned, because he's my life. Like, but if he was bad for my kids, I promise you he wouldn't be there. Make a wish. <laughs> <laughs> Today is Jensen's 11th birthday. Like father, like son, the party is held in the local nightclub, Dexter's. And Courtney has laid on some entertainment for the younger ones. Which is silly because the red one bombs attack the white one bombs. Where's your rabbit? Oh, how about you? <laughs> Saw him in half. This is a key ring. Blow! And count out loud. One. I don't think they're um, kids' magic things, is it? It's not enough colours and sort of rabbits and things. Yeah, it's all that. The blue pom pom and all that. How much did you pay? About 20. 80 pounds an hour. There they are. I could have got prostitutes for that. Bring the bottom ring like that. Hold it like that. Say one, two, three. One, two, three. Off you go. They're enjoying it. It's you that's not. Oh, I wanted, I wanted something that actually I would be interested in. I know that trick. Get the magic dust, sprinkle it on. Courtney's patience finally there. runs out with the magician. Out, you okay. What's this? No game. So, listen, all right, all right, all right. Everyone jump up. Quick, up. Stand on him, chair. Pack up all your stuff, mate. Honestly, I'm really not bad magic. Where's the fucking magic? First one who can put a whole sandwich in their mouth without chewing it, go! Time to celebrate with the grown-ups. With his autobiography proving profitable, Courtney follows up with a second book about his experiences on the English rave scene. His words of wisdom on this subject are now deemed important enough to make the news. I'm not actually trying to glamorise crime, I'm not trying to glamorise drug taking, I'm just trying to make it palatable to people that really don't understand. You know, it's a lot easier for a child now to say at 14 years old to his mum, I've had an E, because his mother has most probably had one in her life and will understand exactly how to talk to him. Now that Dave's decided to go straight and the wife is not there anymore, I'm, it, I'm much happier, I'm a much happier, much calmer person. I, I know that when he walks out the door it's something legitimate that he's doing. I mean, that everyone agrees with. I've got a present for you here, Joe. Come here. You've got a full membership for the Courtney Gang. There's a solid for last bucket, another lot of ladies and gentlemen. I know it, it'd be easier for the, for the world to believe him if he didn't have them people that round him, but... Terry Turbo, come here. Half of them people have got bullet holes for him, you know what I mean, or cuts for him, you know, that, you know where he actually owes them a favour, you know, like where they've... Do you know what I mean? Now, how do you repay that to someone by going, I'm, I'm going to go be straight now, so I can't ring you anymore? To escape your criminal past can be hard, especially when some of your current associates are themselves less than honest. Courtney was to learn this to his cost, both now and later. We've had Dave's book launch and we set up a little area for him to sign his books and behind him was a plinth which had an iron uh, cast of his head which was my artist proof and um, well basically some of his bloody nicked it. I don't have another copy. My value on it is about £10,000 worth and I can't believe on his book launch uh, um, someone, especially with the people that were here, that someone will actually have the liberty to actually fucking lick it. Um, I'm not that concerned that I'm not going to get it back. I'm quite concerned that it's actually been done in the first place. It's um, a little bit embarrassing, <laughs> to say the least. Right, but I will get it back. I will get it back. Courtney went looking for his bust unaware that an old adversary was following him. The long arm of the law was about to drag Courtney back into a past world he claimed he had left behind forever. In September 1999, the very month of his book launch, 
the police arrested him for conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. We was in a big stretch uh, Mercedes with uh, my driver. I was on the motorway and it was, I just had a very successful book signing, you know, and things get carried away and we both ended up um, naked in the back of this uh, Mercedes. And then the next minute we were surrounded by police and they had an infrared light on him. And I'm like, God, <laughs> what is going on? And, um, what was the infrared light on? From, you know, the marksman thing, because um, that's how they come for Dave, no matter what it is. And then there's a get out, so I've had, and got out, and all I'd on was an odd. You know, <laughs> I mean, I'm just standing there. I said, now can I put my trousers on? I've been arrested for perverting the course of justice with a number of other people, um, one of them being a police officer. If I was guilty in this case and got found guilty, then I could get anything up to 10 years. But, um, you know, I don't even expect to go to court. Courtney was given bail. He'd been arrested for perverting the course of justice with a corrupt police officer called Detective Constable Austin Warnes, whom Courtney had known for years. Warnes was at the centre of a plot to frame an innocent woman called Kim James, who was involved in a custody battle with her husband, Simon James. James had hired a private detective called Jonathan Rees to plant drugs on his wife in order to discredit her so he could win custody of the child. After the drugs were planted, Detective Constable Warnes was told to organize a raid on Kim James. But anti-corruption detectives were on to Warnes. They rightly suspected Kim James was innocent and that the drugs were planted, so they challenged him to produce a source for the information. Warnes decided to con Courtney into becoming that source. He pretended to Courtney that he needed him to pose as an informant to explain to his superiors why he'd mixed with Courtney and others in the past. Warnes managed to convince Courtney that the Kim James story was a total fiction made up to help Courtney pose as an informant. Courtney agreed to go along with the plan, but he was suspicious and demanded an insurance policy. And so I went, well, I'll do it for you. But I need a safety net in case anything ever blew up. I, I need to prove that this is all bollocks, you understand what I mean? So he agreed to let me tape him, my wife take a photo of him, and my friend be a witness of it, and he allowed me to sit here and him say, Dave knows nothing about this, this is absolute cack, I'm banging trouble, you know what I mean, He's, I'm just pulling on a mate to help me out of a bit of trouble. Well, he's actually let me tape the whole thing. And that's, and that's it. And they, and they need this tape now to get him whatever sentence they want to give him, right? So I'll produce the tape so they know I'm nothing to do with the case. They should let me off, right? But they can't because if they do that, I might not turn up to give evidence against him, which I most probably wouldn't, you know, to be honest. I most probably wouldn't have. And so to guarantee that I'd have to produce this tape in, in court, they'll keep me arrested for something they know I, I, I know nothing of. I was a completely innocent party. I'll hand the tape over in court, the judge will say, OK, not guilty, but then they can use that to crucify him. Although Warnes had landed Courtney in trouble, he had no regrets about their past corrupt relationship. She kept you out of prison? Oh, yeah, she kept me out of prison, yeah. She kept an awful lot of my friends out of prison as well, and, um... Although I'd like to beat the living shit out of him today, he's done nothing for me and mine apart from be good. You know, he's a very good um, arrow in my bag, he was. I've very good strings of my bow. And um, it'd be easy to go, I wish I'd never met him. But there's been too many pluses I've had through meeting him. And if I was to go back into crime, I would somehow try and get in bed with another policeman. November the 8th, 1999. It is Courtney's first appearance at the magistrate's court. 
the police demanded a hefty bail sum as security to ensure his future attendance, along with the tape recording. How much is that? Like 50 grand. Oh, for my mate. <laughs> Let's hope you don't fucking run off. <laughs> if the court jester was worried, he wasn't showing it. Apparently, this was just a big joke. I just think it's apt. A court jester is, is most probably exactly why I am. I enjoy courts. I am, uh, in a battle of tongues, I am much better than most of them. And, um, especially when I know I've got the winning end, I can have a right little play. Just relax. Normality. It's normal, isn't it? You go to the villain, you go to court. No. Regular. It's not going to school, is it? Well, justice. <laughs> I involve all my mates in all my big events, you know, whether it be parties, book launches, court cases, funerals, you know, I've, I've um, ever involved and try and suck the best out of it that I possibly can. And being in a good mood, or laughing, or keeping everyone bubbly, is um, also a very good disguise for a lot of things, you know. You can hide fear with laughter, you can hide being shy with laughter. You can also hide anger with laughter. And later on in the court waiting room, Courtney assaulted Warns as revenge for framing him. I always had faith in the British justice system. <laughs> And I promise for as long as I've got a hole in my arse, I'll continue to punch that geezer in the face every time I see him. Thank you. Okay. It's just adjourned for six weeks. Um, I'm pleased, but it's exactly what I thought would happen. And between now and the committal, I should imagine all, all the uh, charges against me will be dropped. Warns decided not to press charges, but Courtney had other concerns. Oh yeah, the thing that hasn't actually gone according to my plan, right, is he's actually got bail, so they give him six months out here to do whatever he wants to me. Courtney knew what he would do in Warns' position, and fueled by this perceived threat, he had even taken security precautions. If Warns was down to court to produce a bit of evidence that was going to give me 20 years, and he was out on bail, I promise you, he would never get to court. Right? Take that however you want. I personally wouldn't do nothing, but I promise you, he would not get to court. Right? If it meant if he turned up while I got 20 years and he was out on bail, I'd make sure he never, ever, ever got to court. I'm sorry, but I would. Right? Not that I'm a nasty person, she says I love my wife and kids too much. Right? And if I can get out of not going to prison, I will. And so should anybody. Warns was having to try very hard to keep out of prison. The police were now asking serious questions about his past relationship with Courtney. To explain the relationship, Warns claimed that Courtney was his long-time informant. I've now got to prove that he's actually one of my bank covers. But he, so he's accusing you of being... Been a grass. For the underworld, this is one of the most serious of accusations. You're just going against all the codes of being a man. Just being a testosterone-filled man to your fellow men. You know, you do not do that. It just, you just don't do it. You should be able to take it on the chin when you get in trouble with yourself and not go, oh, I'll share the blame to, or whatever reason you do them things. Right? And as a man, I wouldn't do it. And as a man, you shouldn't do it. And if you are someone that does do it, you do deserve not to be around other men. One year on from his appearance in the magistrate's court, and problems were mounting for the Courtney household. The police still needed him to provide his taped evidence against Warns, and the case had now progressed from the magistrate's court to the Old Bailey. Another fucking court day. <laughs> <laughs> What's that notice that, um, that says, will you stop pestering my guests? When Please have just stop every fucking body. I swear to God that they go stop the babysitter at fucking two o'clock in the morning going up, what are you doing there? Do you know he's this? Do you know he's that? And saying to the mum, do you mind your children, Bill? What's that about? So where are you, put, where are you putting the notice? I'm doing print on me fucking gate. If by any chance things went wrong in this case, Courtney could be looking at ten years in jail for conspiracy. But he was trying to keep up appearances.
if I was to have a show, any kind of oh babe, 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 oh, to her, then she would be like that. If she would be like that, the children would be like that. Mm. Uh, and they'd be going to cook, go all going, uh, trying to do a spelling test, thinking, am I going to be there for the next 20 years? I've had a cold for nearly two weeks. That's because he won't keep coming off the... It gets in the bath, out the bath, gets dressed, on the motorbike. Whoosh. I've got nothing to do with it, babe. Yes, it is, babe. You get a cold like that. True. Not proper wrapped up. You don't want to put on any thermals because he says it's not sexy and it ain't hard. It's not menacing. I'm like, yeah, but it's bloody warm. Jenny was having to keep her own act together. Her 34-year-old brother, John, had died recently in hospital following a tragic illness. There's a lot happening in your life at oh. the moment, isn't there? Yeah, a bloody lot. Uh, how, how are you feeling about your brother now? Um, I haven't actually got my head around that, really. Every time I talk about him, or time I go to my mum's house, and I have, like, loads of tears, and, you know? The fact that he decorated my house is in every room that I go in. Don't look at the kitchen. <laughs> this is Dave's idea. <laughs> like, Sorry, John. Dave made him to wallpaper the fridge. <laughs> this is what the fridge looks like. <laughs> anyway, I came home and started scraping it off for my brother. Off after you build it for my brother. Yeah, because he didn't want to do this. He didn't want to do this, you know, he didn't want to do this fridge. So I just I come home as mum's you know, therapy, not to break, I suppose, for John. We'll take a chance and go down it wherever it goes. Jump the fucking lights. Is it, is it going anywhere? Hold on. Yeah, we'll hit it. Hello? Hello, mate. I'll uh, go to, uh, through Greenwich. Don't go down the, don't go down the, um, don't go down by the Blackwell Tunnel. You know, if only the police could actually respect the fact that I've actually, we've actually suffered a bereavement, you know what I mean? But they wouldn't actually, they've got no sympathy anyway. But with everything else that's going on in Dave's life as well, and with the cat and mouse thing that they're doing, the fact that my brother died, it's just like, cry about it, forget about it, get on, like, because too much worry is put on that. I'm not, not worried, it's just the, what are they going to do next? What are they going to do next? Like, they actually... so, so in a sense, you've not been able to grieve? No, not, not at all, really, true. How's Jenny been? Who's down? She still, last time, you said that she was um, still upset about the funeral and about the brother. She's, how's she doing on that front? Um, she hides it more. <coughs> She's learning to hide it and not let it um, be all and do all of everything. No, then there's a lot of that. If only I did this and if only I'd done that, you know, around his death as well, because it actually started where he cut himself, mending his girlfriend, Seti, who's banging his stomach in the claw hammer, banged him on the leg. But that day, he was gonna, he dropped, I dropped him off home and I was moaning about how much cleaning I've got to do. And he said, I'll come back with you, Jen, tidy up. I said, no, John, it's your Christmas tomorrow as well. It's Christmas Eve. I said, it's your Christmas tomorrow as well. You know I mean, you're with your new bird and that. He goes, Nicky, don't mind. We'll both come back and help you. And I, I was thinking, if I didn't, if I said, oh, come on then, John, come and help me, he wouldn't have been mending the city, he wouldn't have cut himself, that's how I feel. But you can't? I can't, I know, but I just can't stop feeling like that. Guilt? Yeah. Traffic's gonna beat me, innit? Right, sir. Fuck it, do this to me. It's important to get there on time, isn't it? Oh, very, 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 yeah, because it just looks so, um, rude if you're not, you know what I mean? You've had, like, six months warning to get here on time. Don't tell me you can't get there because the traffic's bad. Well, you know, you should have been here. It's an important day for you. You know, that's, that's how they're going to look at it, and there's no excuse yeah, for actually right. being late for the Bailey. And I've been late once already, you know what I mean? Which lad? With the same judge? Yes. The last time I was up in front of him, and he said to me, you know, Da, 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 da. Courtney managed to arrive in time to see Warns plead guilty. He was eventually sentenced to four years in prison. 
welcome news for Courtney. With Warns out of the picture, Courtney hoped the accusations that he was a grass would cease. Now he presumed the police would drop their case against him. To his surprise, this did not happen. They still believed he was guilty of conspiracy. The pressure was on for this supposed ex-criminal. They are keeping my life at the moment on pause. I can't go to work, I can't do any filming, I can't do any book signings, I can't, um, I can't bring out the records, I, you, you, you can't put this documentary out, you know, I can't go on holiday. I'd, well, they got, have, they got your passport? Well, they got one of them, you know. This is the real criminal life, you know, I mean, forget the glamour and the nice cars and the nice suits and all that, this is real what it's like to be on the wrong side of the law. Running backwards and forwards to police stations and hoping you was just a little bit smarter this time. Because the one time you lose that little war you have with them, you go to prison. Do you think you deserve it? I don't know. Ish. <laughs> Things were not all doom and gloom for Courtney. His bust had been returned voluntarily and anonymously in a taxi for the opening of Nick Reynolds and Anthony Oliver's exhibition on infamous criminals. What do you think? Um, wow. Well, I'm sort of honoured. It's, um, it's something that I thought um, only happened to you when you died. You know, bust of your head and this is wow. This is just uh, wow. Unfortunately for Courtney, there was a new problem just around the corner. An altercation has happened between Mad Frankie Fraser and Dave Courtney. It's to do with age and it's to do with codes. And what we've really come against here is you've got the brotherhood of the old school opposed to someone who subscribes and pays homage to the old school. But he wasn't there, so there's an element of where He's become the figurehead, um, yet in their minds, he, he hasn't justified it. In every different walk of life, there's rivalry, you know, whether you run a magazine, run a football team, promote yourself, you know, there's rivalry. You, know? you, have, to have, an, uh, you have to have somebody else. It actually drives you on, it's healthy. But this rivalry became less than healthy when Fraser repeated the accusation that Courtney was a grass. Uh, someone that I thought was um, a friend, a colleague, has come out and called me a grass, and it's it shell shocked me. It's knocked me a bit sideways. I, uh, of course, it's, it is a little bit frightening, you know, the, the sort of <coughs> repercussions of having that said about you and all that. And um, what are the repercussions? Um, well, repercussions could be me ending up floating down the Thames, you know. Um, an awful lot of people will. Listen to the man, you know, he's quite quite an influential man. Right now it's just making me feel angry, it makes me feel sick. True, because they know the consequences. Whoever said it knows the consequences. There's not one alleged in that story. The accusation had also offended Courtney's own bizarre criminal code. All villains seem to fall out with each other at the end of the day. Yeah, but never as seriously as you're a grass. That's about as serious as you could possibly say. You know, I'd rather be a fucking rapist than a grass. At least another man who gets an island and goes rocking off understand that. The fact that they can actually like, take the kids down the road for a lolly and then they're already, at a, you know, in their lives are in danger because some has gone, yeah, days are quite right. You know, that, that, what, that, you know, it makes me angry. It fucks me off. And from what I hear, he's not even telling the chosen few. You know, he's, uh, he's actually put it in the newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, fucking hell. <laughs> I'm laughing, but it's not funny. It's not funny. Two weeks into the trial at the Old Bailey, and Courtney was accused of being a registered informant in open court, and everybody heard. The Old Bailey has been told that a corrupt detective and a police informer helped in a plot to frame a woman with drugs so that she would lose a custody battle. Courtney and three others deny conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. Now, if anyone puts up now, once they've gone, they've got his uniform on the jelly. Anyone, anyone in the world can just walk out of my door, knock on the door, and that's how the door, shoot me and run off, and he'd never get caught because he's now made it that 
the motive for it had just been on television. Anyone in the world. Who would be bothered to have a go at you like that, though? Who would be bothered to shoot Dave Courtney? Who could be bothered? I can't wish I knew that myself. Huh? Good to shut me up. The big thing for me here is just, like any man, you like to be well thought of. And yesterday my kids went to school and their dad was a hero. Yesterday. To all their schoolmates, their one dad called me, their dad was a hero. Even their dads, their mates' dads fought on a hero. Today, I'm going to school and they will most really be ridiculed and be given a really hard time because of their dad is what they think their dad is. Now I can handle it because it just goes right over the top of my head and I laugh at everything. Asking 12 year old boy and all that to it. Please understand why they're saying this about your dad might be really hard and they have now got to live with my, with my bird. Right, instead of, that's my dad, huh? They might have to go. That's my dad. Who's the lovely girl? Okay. Yeah, I love you. Oh, people no longer want like, their kids to come. Like, Phil used to have wicked sleepovers. She can't have them anymore. It's not, you know, no one would come. Not, you know, I wouldn't want to send my kids to someone's house who's, who's, you know, someone that one of the occupants could be in, their lives could be in danger. <coughs> Hitler was doing well until he started fighting on too many fronts, you understand what I mean? I feel like I'm being attacked from a load of different fronts, you know? For... Uh, I feel like... Well, you are being attacked from one of them. Yeah, 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 of course, you know? When, when... The court cases, there's... People under the pressure of court cases. And in the pressure of being called a graphic and that thing. And in the pressure of being ever so Mr. Popular one day and then everyone in the world wants to shoot you the next day. You know, uh, actually feeling that they are beating you, you know, the police, and they are actually winning. It was on fighting on so many different fronts at the moment, and I know that isn't, it isn't good. And the normal person would actually go under by that. Any one of these people fucking top themselves for, wouldn't they? I'm too fine. I know my kids shouldn't have to, like, bear the brunt for the fact that, because oh, I love Dave Courtney, they shouldn't have to suffer, but... I don't think that they're suffering, you know, and I just hope to God that it just, you know, nothing happens, nothing does happen. Why don't you just leave? Why should I leave? Because, you know, because my life wouldn't be the same. I love Dave Courtney. I promise you, I'm, I, it sounds really, like, muggy and stupid, but I can't anticipate life after Dave Courtney. That is the truth. Losing the argument that I was working for Ben Policeman has completely different effects on my life than losing the argument whether I'm a class or not, because, um, it would actually end my life. 100% sure and rightly so, if it was proved I was a registered informant. Now I'm, I'm now arguing for my life. The six week long trial at the Old Bailey has come to an end and the jury are due to give their verdict today. I just wonder how you're feeling this morning, because of course this could be, I suppose, the last time you see Dave for a while. How do I feel? Anxious. Well, okay. I, can't really, I can't really express something. Ask me later on. Sorry. 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 It feels quite normal. Why is that? Even. I'm more than confident I'm coming home. Plus, I've been in this position before once or twice. <laughs> Jenny's quite upset, isn't she? Yeah, she's a bit upset, yeah. yeah. 
I mean, you could still go to jail, couldn't you? Yeah. Do you, you have to prepare yourself for that, or does it just let it happen when it happens? Or? Um... What does... You can't prepare yourself for jail. If you're lucky enough to have prior knowledge that you're going, then there's a few things you should do, you know. First thing is, stick a couple of ounces to puff up your bum. Oh, and the beetle. I've just done it with puffing. One. You've what have you done? Stuck an ounce of puff up your ass. An ounce of cannabis? Yeah, an ounce of cannabis, yeah. Why? Um, well, it could go against all the odds, and then I end up going to prison, and from the second I get in there, I've, I've got currency. You know, I'll, I'll, um, because I'm afraid puff is currency in prison, you know, you know what I mean? You're trying to live on, um, I don't know what it is, £5.50 a week, buy your fags, toiletries, and food, and all that out of £5 a week. You know, and I've said to people, like, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it all my life. Because I've watched people that have got millions of pounds out here, and uh, they own millions of, have got millions of pounds, end up going to prison, and because they haven't got anything to barter with, they're skin. They've got no Rice Krispies, no soap, no rizzers, no honey, no nothing. They've got nothing. They've got a million pounds out here, but there's, there's some little fella in there who's got, been sneaking in and out of puff every two or three weeks. He sells like the inside of Argos. You know, <laughs> racks, racks of it. Over there by the economy burgers. <laughs> the geezer made me laugh last night. He um, came round here about half three in the morning, drop it off for me. And um, I normally just take it. And when it comes to whatever amount it comes to, you know what I mean? He goes, oh, do you know it's about that much now? And I go, they are. But because he knew I was going away, he wanted me to pay for it. He wanted to pay for it right there. I threw it on the heart. And then just come home. You've got to be careful, so have I. You know, I don't want to wait seven years for me 50 quid. <laughs> you bastard. <laughs> you go down. What she thinks is it just um it's a never ending battle. Because we've actually sat here a couple of times like this and this law of averages you can't keep winning. So you know it like that. <sighs> Makes it very alright for me to cry if I wanted to, and then sometimes you can get close to it if you understand what I mean by that. Alright? Not that I'm gonna cry. Please believe me, I ain't. become a massive problem, yeah, because they only, they, you know, you're so cut off from reality in prison, you actually live on the newspapers, you live it, you know, that is your only contact with reality, and um, it's been in the newspapers that I'm a, an informant, and if you're in prison, there it is, you're an informant, you know, Arsenal 1, 2, 1, fact, her uh, name's Tracy so-and-so, page 3, Dave's an informant, you know, it would be, um, clean cut, so I should imagine I would have a fucking hell of a time if I, if I actually went to prison with this still hanging over my head. I'm, I feel as if, as if the jury, general public, you know, I'm not even people that don't know me, don't actually want Dave Courtney to be found a grass because it ruins the whole romance of the criminal thing, you understand what I mean? And um, it's very, very, very important in the job that I'm in now that it, you stay on the right side of the popularity thing with the, with the people. And being accused of being accused of being a cop. That's definitely put a dampener on that, I should imagine, if it actually um, works. One of the kids asked me this morning if, if, if it went wrong or if I got guilty, how long would he get? And I haven't, I've 
refuse to even answer it because I haven't even thought of it. I wouldn't even let myself. It's negative. I don't want to go down that road. I don't want to. I don't want to allow myself to even think negative. I'm not bitter. I don't want to be bitter. I can't be bitter. Why can't you be bitter? Because I feel like he's, you know, you know what I mean? He's brought, almost brought it on himself. Although it's, you know, it's brought on, you know, you know what I mean, don't you? It's like a cat and mouse thing with the police and Dave. But it's not fair that I should have to suffer this and my kids' father. And you want it to come to an end? And I want it to come to an end, I do, but it won't, though. This will not be the end of it. Trust me on that one. It's like my life ain't cut out for that. And it ain't fair for him either, because he's, he's just trying to do things legitimate. And he just drop us off at the pub. Oh, look, there they are, out there. Keep going up. Yeah, just there on there, yeah, drop us off, yeah. Fifteen months on since Courtney's arrest, but today the waiting will be over in minutes. Courtney had been acquitted, along with another defendant. But Simon James, husband of Kim James, and Jonathan Rees, the private detective, both got six years for their part in the conspiracy. I always had faith in the British justice system. But... Courtney also hoped that the grass accusations were now well and truly behind him. Yes. We won't know. I do hope you all realise that that not guilty was for the actual crime and the uh, accusations that I was actually across. I do hope you know that. I'm not going to go. What did you get? What did you get? Not guilty. Hey. Oh, son. Honestly. That no, man, I can put it into words. Trust me, best feeling ever. Courtney was about to be joined in his celebrations by some unexpected but important visitors. The jury. Now, now I will fucking open up some tins of worms for them that they fucking won't believe. They're trying to hurt me like that, I'll fucking hurt you. I will hurt you. recounts the inside stories of some controversial murder mysteries. Beginning with the Chris Barron's wife. That's tomorrow night at 10.20.